Um, our vision is to see the glory of God known in London and the nations. And for us, this isn't just like words. For us, this is what we live with. This is what we breathe. This is our prayer. This is our passion. This is, this is who we are. This is the reason why we exist, is that God would be known in London. We believe that healing and power uh, is known in God and in his son, Jesus Christ. And he is the one that London needs and the nations need. And the key verse really that we're hanging this term on and a lot of what we're looking to in the future as a church is Habakkuk 2.14. I hope you, if you've been with us for a few weeks, you will know this, you will probably be sick of it by now. But if you haven't memorized this verse, Habakkuk 2.14, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This is a promise for us. We don't know the bit between now and the end of the, end, end of the days, but we know that the, the very final point, the final note that will be struck will be glorious. Hollywood says that we are moving towards this kind of decaying, dark, zombie-filled age where it's just all terrible. The scriptures paint a picture of glory as the final note of all of history. And we are moving as a church with that goal in mind and so this term we've been walking through what that means what is the glory of God what does it mean to live with a vision in the future and over the next three weeks what I want to do is basically break down what the glory of God being known in London today might look like because for a lot of us you might say hey that sounds nice like glory of God it might sound a little bit inspiring but what the heck does it actually mean is it like this mist that kind of descends on London and we all like oh the glory of God is here you know we're like do you have you sensed the glory of God or what what actually is it and that's what I want to look over the next three weeks because the the thing with Christianity is that it's actually a very materialistic faith it's a faith that engages the stuff of life. A lot of people think if you get religion, if you get faith, then you begin to not be interested in the normal, boring, trivial things. You know, I'm not, I'm not concerned about health or clothes or finances because I'm now a spiritual person. I went to the gym on Friday, whenever it was, and uh, I got chatting to a guy, and I don't normally chat, because I normally have my headphones in, I'm not very sociable at the gym, but anyway, we got chatting, and he found out I was a pastor, and most people, when they find out I'm a pastor, they, they don't physically take three steps back, but you can see in their brain, they're like, okay, um, right, how do I exit this conversation? Uh, anyway, we carried on a little bit more, and he said, I cannot believe there is a pastor in the gym. I was like, what? Like we just, yeah, we don't eat, no, we just, we just pray and we just, you know, like, I mean, it was interesting because I went away from that thinking, yeah, I think that's what a lot of people think. Like if you get religion, if you get spirituality, why would you be concerned about normal things like going to the gym? Because you're now a pastor, you're, you're a man of God, you've got faith, you know, and it's like this kind of dichotomy. You're either spiritual or you're like worldly. But Christianity is this amazing um, moment where it kind of joins physicality and spirituality together. God is the one who created the heavens and the earth. He created you. He created your digestive systems. He created blue whales. He created the Himalayas. He created everything that we have. He loves stuff. There wasn't an accident like this is like the dross of the actual creation. Like, oh, I made some souls and I had this like byproduct of physical stuff. What do I do with this? And I will leave it for a while and then we'll sort it out at the end of the age. This was his actual intention to make physical stuff. So much so that when God came down in himself in Jesus, Jesus Christ he came down as a man he didn't come down as like this floaty ghost-like figure like I don't want to touch these like physical dirty people I'm just gonna like he came down as a man and he didn't come like holding his nose for 33 years like these people stink I can't wait till I get out of here because when he was raised up from the dead his resurrection was bodily in form and he lives in the flesh to this day at the right hand of the father Amen. Amen. And we're told that the very end of the age is not all of us, the saints of God, who get taken up into this floaty existence with fat cherubs and harps. That is not the final note of history. Thanks, Mandy, for laughing. <laughs> Appreciate it. Keep it up. 
the final notice history is that actually heaven descends onto the earth and joins with the physical realm so that the end of days is here on earth glorified london which is good news for me because you told me like hey believe in jesus and your reward is you get to spend 10,000 years floating around with some fat cherubs playing harps and like Jesus is like wafting around like that doesn't sound like good news to me I'm like no 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 that's not, not what I'm after because we're built to enjoy stuff so the glory of God being made known in London can actually be seen and touched and smelt and known we are not praying for some ethereal thing and the scriptures talk about three primary realities when we talk about the glory of God. It talks about, firstly, that the glory of God is known in people who follow Jesus Christ and are filled with his Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come and dwell in temples. And in the New Testament, when Jesus comes, what happens is the Holy Spirit, the presence of God, comes and dwells in people like you and me. The infinite and holy God comes and he dwells in finite, sinful people like us. It's an incredible thing. We are now living, moving temples of the Holy Spirit. And when people come in contact with us, they come in contact with the glory of God. Amen. The second thing is this, and I'm going to come back to the first one, is that the glory of God is known in community. Very ordinary community. No razzmatazz, no hype, just men and women, friends together, diverse, multi-generational, doing life together, displays the wisdom and the beauty of God. That no sociological study could explain why these people are gathering in this place. But they do. Why? Because of God and because Jesus Christ has gathered their hearts. This strange thing happens when people become Christians, that there is this strange magnetism towards other Christians. Have you noticed this? When you became a Christian, if you were him, you were a Christian. I became a Christian. And I suddenly had this compelling draw to be with other believers. I was speaking to Amir, oh, Amir's here, Amir's here, and he said, in, in Iran, becoming a Christian, there was nothing to gain by going to church, and there was everything to lose, and yet he said, I just had to be with other believers, and cost him a lot to do that, and in community, filled with the Holy Spirit, the glory of God is known, and thirdly, the glory of God is known in culture that reflects God's beauty. And by culture, I mean the stuff that we collectively produce. And I also mean the way that we behave with each other. And in this, the glory and the beauty of God can be known. The Trinitarian, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, beautiful relationships. As we live that out here in London, people may not have the vocabulary to say that's the glory of God. But they know they will have touched something that is more than the sum of those people because there is culture being produced that reflects the beauty of God. And what I want to do over the next three weeks is talk about Christ followers today, community next Sunday, and then culture producing to the glory of God in two weeks time. Is that all right? And what I want to do today is really just, I, I want to walk through Romans. And uh, if you know the letter to the Roman church, um, you may think, oh my goodness, like this is 16 dense theological chapters. Uh, when is this sermon going to end? <laughs> to be honest, I don't know, but I'm going to do my best to uh, like honour the time frame of, I think it was around 5.30. So we'll see how we get on. Um, but th this is the thing. You, you and I, when we became Christians took on a whole new level of giving glory to God. Because when God made us, he made us in his image. And us as his image reflect his, his beauty. It's this, it's this amazing moment where God creates the heavens and the earth, we're told, and he sets this public, continual sermon in place so that every day when you would wake up, you would see some of the glory of the Lord 
He sets just the universe around us and says, I want to display some of my majesty, some of my size, some of my strength, some of my wisdom in the creation around everyone. And I'm going to place some human beings made in my image in the center of this so that they may walk around, as John Calvin said, my theater, the theater of God. They might wake up and know, God, 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 I see you. And he made us in his image amazing. We are beacons of the glory of God. And the thing is this, that we are made, you and I, as the chief beacons to the glory of God in all of the world. God got to work on Sunday morning. Jewish calendar, Sunday to start of the week. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, God was at work in Genesis 1. And he closes his week out. Deadline's coming, Friday night's coming, Sabbath is coming. He closes his week out with the apex of his creation, which is not the Himalayas, which is not the sun or the solar system, which is you. You are the apex of God's creation. And in you, the glory of God is meant to be known primarily. It's an incredible thing that in your face, let these words sink in for a moment, in your face right now, and you might think, no, 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 not my face. I woke up and whatever. No, in your face, there is more of the glory of God than there is in the sun burning with all of its infinite degrees of heat and power. Do you believe that? Yes. In your face, there is more of the glory of God than you will find in all of the traveling, in all of the years out, in all of the Grand Canyon, in all of the Himalayas. In your face, there is more glory than that because God says, in my image, you are made. Nothing else is made in God's image. Everything else is made to display the glory of God. And yet there is one creature, significant, set apart, human beings who are displaying the glory of God. And us in our stupidity, we walked away from his glory. We said, actually, we're going to try and do things our own way, do things by ourselves. And in that, we, lo we, we began to see glory for ourselves and not glory for God. And the very thing we were made for, to give God glory, we lost. And so what we have in Romans is Paul's theological treatise of a personal conversion back to the glory of God as the center of our life. Because becoming a Christian is not just about doing some extra things on a Sunday morning. It's actually about a whole reorientation of your life. So that's what I want to get to. Is that all right? So Romans chapter one, and I've got like 10 scriptures or so that I want to walk through. And I'm watching the time. If it really is going on long, just someone sound a klaxon or something like that, and we'll, I promise I'll stop. Um, what I want to do is just walk through some scriptures and just explain Paul's theology of a personal conversion to the glory of God. Because this was a man who knew what it was to hate God at one point and then to love him. He was a man who didn't have faith in Jesus and then he found faith in Jesus and he's found his life reoriented around a whole new glory and it wasn't his self. So the first verse of this letter we have is Romans 1 chapter 1, chapter 1 verse 1 says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the, for the gospel sorry, of God. Let me stop here. What is, the, what is the good news, the gospel that we have as a church? It is not his three things to add to your life. You might be a better you. Here's a, here's, a, here's a few tips for you and you might be a better person in the workplace. No, the very core, the very essence of the gospel, the good news that we have is God himself in his glory. He is our good news. London thinks that God is this grumpy guy in the sky if they believe he's there at all. But we have different news that we have met him and he is glorious. And he is happy and he loves London and has a plan for every single soul in this city. This is the good news. One theologian says this. Leon Morris, Romans is a book about God and no topic is treated with anything like the frequency of God. Everything Paul touches in his letter, he relates to God. There is nothing like it elsewhere. This is the good news that we have, God himself. And then he says in verse four, these words at the end, um, I'll read from verse five, sorry. He says, God, through whom we have grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. 
So it's, why is Paul being sent across the nations and across Europe at this point? For the sake of the obedience of faith, for the sake of his name. So let me just get these two concepts for you. The obedience of faith and the sake of his name. The obedience of faith is, hey, how do you respond to the gospel? Hey, well, you've got to obey some stuff. Because it's the obedience of faith. The way that you respond to the gospel, the good news, is by simply putting your trust in God. It's taking a deep breath and saying, I'm going to stop trying to get God's approval. I'm going to stop trying to do religion and I'm going to trust him and what he has said about my life and the life to come. And in doing that, you do it for the sake of his name, which is for the sake of his glory. Because when you put your faith and your trust in God, you glorify God and all he is. Because when God says, I can save you and you say, I believe you. You. you glorify the worth of who God is. If God says, I'm powerful to raise you from the dead so that when you do die, that's not the last thing that will happen to you. There is eternal life coming. And you say, I believe you. What you do is you actually glorify and magnify the word of God. And you, as you trust him, you, say, you, you make him look powerful. If you say, like, I trust God with my life, everything, you make God look as powerful as he is. Some of you might have heard this story of the, uh, a guy in the 1800s called Charles Blondin. Have you ever heard of this guy? His actual French name is Jean Val something, not Jean Valger. <laughs> Jean Francois Gravelet. If you're French, I hope I've said that with enough panache. He was an acrobat and a tightrope walker, and he spent his time putting on these shows across the Niagara Falls. And you can like Google this guy, he's an amazing guy. And he would, and it's like one of the longest tightrope that has been like made, not invented, ropes, whatever. But he made these tight ropes and he would put on these displays, people would pay to come and watch this guy walk across this tight rope across the Niagara Falls. And he would take like one of those acrobat, you know, balancing beams and he would do that and he would walk back and forwards and then he'd throw it away and then he'd go and walk back and forwards. And then apparently he would do stuff like, he would take like a little cooker sometimes and he would fry an egg and eat an egg in the middle of the Niagara Falls by himself on this tight rope walker and he would like walk backwards blindfolded the guy was absolutely nuts and this wasn't like a cgi kind of david blaine trick he actually did it and there's this, this moment once in 1860 where this royal party came to watch charles blondin do this amazing tightrope walking and the duke of newcastle i don't know his name you can look, look him up later the duke of newcastle and his whole entourage was there and he, uh, on this occasion for this show, he took a wheelbarrow and he started walking back and forth with this wheelbarrow. And then he would put some um, potatoes and just pile sacks of potatoes into this wheelbarrow. And then he would do it again. It's just like walk backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. And he's like, look at me, guys, look what I can do. And everyone's like, Woo! well done, Charles Blondin. You're not dead yet. Woo yeah, and they were going back and forth. And then he approached, literally approached the royal box and spoke to the Duke of Newcastle. Said, do you believe that I could put a man in this wheelbarrow and walk across to the other side safely? And the Duke of Newcastle said, of course I believe that. I've seen you do it time and again. I've read the newspaper articles. I've heard of you eating a fried egg in the middle of this tarot. Like, of course I believe you. And so he asked, you know what's coming. Would you, sir, step into the wheelbarrow and I will take you across the Niagara Falls in this wheelbarrow? At which point he kindly declined and says, no way. And then he went around the crowd and I don't know whether this set up. I can probably imagine it was set up. He asked the whole crowd and everyone's like been cheering 10 minutes earlier. And then he asked, like, OK, who's going to if you if you really love this, trust me then like who's going to step into the wheelbarrow <laughs> everyone's like da, 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 da. So, yeah. it's like it's like an altar call in church like <laughs> and all, everyone's looking at their feet like this is awkward and uh they're saying uh, no, no one and yet this little old lady came forward from the back of the crowd and she put her hand up and she literally no cgi got into the wheelbarrow and charles blondin took his own mum backwards and forwards across the tightrope of the Niagara Falls, which demonstrates faith because his mum actually had living faith that her son could do this. The Duke of Newcastle had intellectual faith, 
said, I believe you could do it, but I'm not going to. Who made Charles Blondin look like he really could do it? His mum. That's what becoming a Christian is. That when you put your faith in Jesus, you say, you can carry my life. You said there's forgiveness, I believe you. You said there's power to heal my soul, I believe you. You said you can take me through death, I believe you. You said you can bring meaning and purpose to my life, I believe you. As you do that, you glorify God for the sake of his name among the nations because you make him look worthy to those around you. And that's what becoming a Christian is. Suddenly, I, I, I believe Jesus. I believe everything he says about me is true. And if we live with that enthusiastically, other people say, I don't believe you're Jesus, but he definitely seems worthy to you. And they might just have their interest piqued. And then he says this, for I am not ashamed, this is verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I believe it's the power of God, do you? I believe it. This is an aside, but you've probably been, anyone heard about Kanye West and his like spiritual awakening? And I know there's lots of people like, oh, it's Kanye, can you trust him? Jury's out still. What, what I know is this, he is speaking very boldly about Jesus at the moment. Jesus is king. And I know my heart this last week of like, I don't know, it seems to be genuine to me, but I'm like, yeah, he is. He's king. He's got power in this world. Like we don't have to get sophisticated. Jesus has power to save London, amen? amen. He has all power in heaven and on earth and the gospel is good news. And I for one believe it. And he says, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. That is the justice, the beauty of his nature is revealed in this gospel. So first and foremost, the gospel isn't tips of how to be a better you. In it, first and foremost, the gospel is about a revelation of whom God is in his love and his justice in his power and his beauty it's God first and last I want to read to you a, um, a couple of paragraphs by a guy called J.I. Packer he wrote an introduction to a book called The Death of Death in the Death of Christ by John Owen. It's not the easiest of reads. In fact, it's probably one of the most difficult theological reads you'll ever have. But he wrote an introduction which was easier to read than the actual book itself. And it's dynamite. The introduction itself is dynamite. And he says this, and he wrote maybe 40 years ago. It's a, it's a whole paragraph long, but I want this, this changed my perspective on Christian mission. The new gospel, he talked about an old gospel, the ancient biblical gospel, and a new gospel that churches are preaching. The new gospel conspicuously fails to produce deep reverence, deep repentance, deep humility, a spirit of worship, and concern for the church. Why? We would suggest that the reason lies in its own character and content. It fails to make humanity God-centered in their thoughts and God-fearing in their hearts because this is not primarily what it's trying to do. One way of stating the difference between it and the old gospel is to say that it is too exclusively ex concerned to be helpful to humanity, to bring peace, comfort, happiness, satisfaction, and too little concern to glorify God. The old gospel was helpful and more so than the new one. But incidentally, for its first concern was always to give glory to God. It was always and essentially a proclamation of divine sovereignty in mercy and judgment, a summons to bow down and worship the mighty Lord on whom man depends for all good, both in nature and in grace. Its centre of reference, the biblical gospel, was unambiguously God. But in the new gospel, the centre of reference is humanity. That is just to say that the old gospel was religious in a way that the new gospel is not. Whereas the chief aim of the old was to teach men to worship God, the concern of the new seems limited to making them feel better. The subject of the old gospel was God and his ways with humanity, and the subject of the new is humanity and how to help and the help God gives them. There is a world of difference. The gospel is a revelation of whom God is. And he makes this profound point that actually when you go to God first and foremost, without any concerns about having help for your life, 
what actually happens is you get more help than if you go directly to God for some tips on how to be a better you. It's a strange thing. If you're willing to lose your life, you actually gain it. And if you put God first and foremost, actually it becomes the most helpful thing in your life. It's like, oh, I'm not interested in the practicalities of you know, being better at work. I'm about God. No, if you actually put God first and foremost, everything else begins to fall into place. It's the power of God. And then he says in verse 18, and we're going to get quicker, I promise. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. What truth are they suppressing? That there is a God, there is a maker, he loves us. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, because God's spirit, namely his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. So that no one is with, with an excuse right now because every moment we see the heavens, we see the skies, we see creation around us we are being told and preached to that there is a God who made us whom we are ultimately accountable to but this is what we did for although they knew God they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened claiming to be wise they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things this is what he's saying so there was this glory infinite source of joy and peace in the glory of God and yet we turn from this source of joy and peace and we said actually I'm going to find the source of my meaning in life in the things of this world and as we did that our minds became darkened and we could not see the glory of God anymore so the issue that we need to resolve is not to be a better me but actually to have my heart and my mind transformed so that I can see the glory of God again this is the key mission that we are on in London it's not this transformation like, hey, we hope you guys like be a bit better morally. No, it's that you meet with God. This is the goal of our church. This is the news that we have. We're not going in like critiquing people's behavior and their morality. No, we, we found God and we want you to meet him because he's glorious. Chelsea won yesterday. It's good news. Boop, boop. Thanks, Tudor. What happened? First thing is, I told Cheeto. He knew already, but I had to tell him anyway because he's a Man United supporter. It's like, there's a little bit of glory in West London at the moment. And what happens? I tell people. What happens when you see glory? You want to tell people. That's all that's happened with us. We've seen glory and we need to tell other people about it. The world is split into two people right now. Glory, everyone's a glory seeker. I hope you know that. I think one of the London mayors, and I say I think because I heard it once and then I haven't been able to track down the actual quote, but so I think a London mayor once said people move to London for three reasons, money, sex and glory. I hope it's true because it'd be amazing for the sermon. <laughs> but everyone theologically is seeking glory, seeking some sense of kind of inner celebrity if I can put it like that some sense of inner profile some sense of inner worth some sense of like inner prestige everyone is seeking glory the difference between Christians and everyone else is that Christians are those who seek glory in God and not glory for themselves this is what he says in Romans chapter 2 verse 6 he says God will render to each one according to his works to those who by patience in well-doing seek glory and honor and immortality to those who are seeking after God I want you to be known Lord I want to know and enjoy you you are the source and the fountain of all life he will give eternal life but for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness there will be wrath and fury this is stark so we are seeking either glory for God or glory for ourselves. We are incredible beings. I hope you know that. Every single one of us in this city is. We are incredible beings. And our, our mission is to help and serve people so that they know the glory of God and become the true person that God has made them to be. C.S. Lewis preached, um, he's the guy who wrote the Narnian um, 
stories. Um, but he also preached every now and again, not very often, but he preached this one sermon called The Weight of Glory. And in it he said this. He says, it may be possible for each of us to think too much of his own potential glory. It is hardly possible for him to think too often or too deeply about that of his neighbor's glory. The load or weight or burden of my neighbor's glory should be laid daily on my back, a load so heavy that only humility can carry it and the backs of the proud will be broken. He says, it's a serious thing to live in the society of possible gods and goddesses. To remember that the dullest and most uninteresting person you talk to, a bit harsh, <laughs> may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship, or else a horror and a corruption such as you know now if you meet them only in a nightmare. All day long we are in some degree helping each other to one or the other of these destinations, and it is in the light of these overwhelming possibilities that we should conduct all of our dealings with one another, our friendships, our loves, our play and our politics. There are no ordinary people. Feels timely in a day like today, doesn't it? If politicians would treat each other like this, with this kind of dignity that there is something in you that if I truly knew the full spectacle of it, I would be tempted to bow down to potentially. He says, you've never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, art, civilizations, these are mortal and their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. But it is immortalities with whom we joke, work, marry, snub and exploit. Immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. It's amazing. And we are both in these two tracks. And our goal as a church is to help people see the glory of God and be transformed into that glory. So that one day the unveiling of who they really are will be truly spectacular. What we need in this gospel is not some tips. And I've said that a few times today. We, we like magazines if you read like if you're a subscriber to any kind of magazine you quickly realize after like month four they're just rehashing the same tips over and over and over again like you're spending a lot of money on basically like oh there's new there's, a, there's six new tips on how to be like a slimmer me i wonder what they, oh okay yeah eat less exercise blah, 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 blah. like it doesn't actually like you you, you go we need something far deeper than something like here's how we need something that's going to transform our inner being and this is what the gospel does so you read in chapter 3 verse 21 this but now the righteousness of god has been manifested apart from the law so christianity is not law based here's some things to do he says um the, the, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe for there is no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God so what if what is the chief wrong that we do in this life you might think oh do you know what on Tuesday I swore because the boss sent me such a bad email and I was so cross with him oh no I you know I had one too many drinks on Friday night and you know like th that's where we tend to think of the, the Bible says the primary sin is falling short of the glory of God that is not living with him at the center of who we are and that's the thing you can't count oh I did six sins this week I used to think like that I used to literally try and count my sins every day. I told Julia on Friday night, like, I used to be quite a boring person. Um, <laughs> not to say I'm super interesting now, but that becomes incredible. <laughs> um, I was like, yeah, yeah, I, I thought I could kind of count all the sins of my day. I've only done six. All right, God, here are my sins, get them forgiven. All right, start again fresh the next day. Little knowing that actually there was a far deeper sin that I was often committing and that I was living life about me. And it was my goals and my ambitions and my dreams and everything revolved around my ego oh no but i i didn't swear this week yeah but did you live for the glory of god oh i haven't really thought about that one and this is what we're told that actually to sin and fall short of the glory of god one definition of sin is in, in romans chapter 14 verse 23 and i read this once and i couldn't i just couldn't believe it Listen to this definition of what sin is. He says, um, whoever, 
Whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats because the eating is not from faith. He's talking about what kind of food should we eat. He says, actually, you can eat anything. If you come into God with faith, it's okay. Like, eat, eat any food, it's fine. He says, for whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. I was like, I read that. I was like, oh my goodness. Anything that I do is not through faith is sin. That changes your definition of sin, doesn't it? It's like, oh, uh, no, I've, I've lived. Have you thought about God? Have you put your trust in God? Why? Because if, if we put our trust in God, if we have faith in him, what happens? We glorify him. Therefore, we match up with the very purpose for why we exist on the earth. Do you get where this is going? So if you're not putting your faith in God, you're not living into your meaning. You're not living into your purpose. Changes everything, I think, of how we go. Oh, look, you're squeaky clean. You don't do all the kind of, any of the, the, the sins that we don't like in this culture anyway. No, no, but are you living for the glory? Have you got trust in his glory? Are you trusting his power and his might? And he says this, this is how we get our hearts changed. He says, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness. That is the cross. The cross, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. And it was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in in Jesus that's complicated but it's basically saying this in the Old Testament God says I'm going to punish any sin that happens if you sin if you walk away from me you're going to die and yet when you read the Old Testament and you read history and you even experience life today what often happens there are people who do not like God they don't like Jesus they sin seemingly in many different ways and yet their life seems to turn out all fine and in fact they do very well and you think, what on earth happened to justice? Because God said, sin, you get punished. And there are all these people walking around, hating God and doing fine in life. How does that? And so when you get to the end of the Old Testament, one of the questions we should have is, didn't God say he was like a God of justice? And how is it working now? Because there are lots of people seemingly sinning all over the place and getting away with it. It's a bit like a parent who says, if you do that one more time, and then like 15 times later, the parent's still not done anything. So you're like, can't be bothered. Is that what God is really like? Like his nature is not actually true to who he is? And how does this re resolution get solved? Because if I'm a sinner, which I put my hand up and say I am, I've done lots of wrong in my life and I haven't lived for the glory of God. If I'm a sinner and I deserve justice, how do I ever get saved? Is it going to bring, it, bring um, salvation about? And so God says, I have a solution. And in Jesus Christ, I'm going to come down to the earth and die and receive justice in your place so that my righteousness and my glory might be vindicated and shone forth and that you may come to me in all righteousness receive my forgiveness because Christ has already taken all of your punishment and my glory will be upheld and you will receive salvation and you will have everlasting joy in this life and that is what the cross is about it is a display of the glory and the justice and the righteousness and the love of God you want to know who God is you go to the cross and as we look to the crucified Savior our hearts are changed from the inside out so now our hope and our our desire is his glory so he says in chapter 5 verse 1 therefore since we have been justified by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ and through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God that when you become a Christian, your whole life revolves around the glory of God. And my final hope in this life is not that whatever, like I'm going to attain something. My final hope is I'm going to see the glory of God. That is what I'm going for. I'm going hard after that now. There was um, just down the road, about 500 years ago, but just down the road nonetheless, there was this council convened um, where church leaders from Scotland and England got together and produced what is now known as the Westminster Catechism. And for some of us, oh, a catechism is basically, it's like this question and answer teaching tool. 
that back in the day before YouTube videos and books that could be printed out everywhere, you just ask questions and have six simple, succinct answers to those questions. And the ch Scottish leaders and the English leaders wanted to unify the church and wanted to produce a document that kind of put forth the core Christian faith and all of the doctrine and just say, this is what it is. This is what we unify around. And it's at the age of the Puritans. And if you heard of the Puritans, they get a really bad rap for being this kind of killjoy, gray type people. But actually, they were people who were serious about joy. And London thinks it's serious about joy. You will go and just scroll through Instagram like, hey, look at my, I'm going out all these times, look at these places, like I'm going, I'm, I'm pursuing, I'm, we, we feel like we're all about joy and finding experience. The Puritans were about joy and finding experience and they had found something better in God. And they, they asked this first question, the whole of this document that still people are looking to to this day, the core essence of the Christian faith. What is the chief end of man? What, what is the very reason why we exist? And they said the chief end of man is this, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And it wasn't what are the chief ends? They didn't ask two things. Like, oh, there's two things you do. You glorify God on a Sunday, and on Monday, you go and have joy. <laughs> no, there's, there's one goal, there's one end, there's one end thing that we're aiming for, and it's the glory of God that is found as we enjoy Him. Because as we enjoy God, He is glorified. Amen? When we say that we find joy and peace in Jesus Christ, people, they might not believe in him, but they might look at him in a different way. If we as a church community worship him and truly enjoy God when we gather on a Sunday, people might not believe the things that we believe about the Bible, but they will at least pay attention to our God. If they walk into here and everyone's like sitting down, hands in their pockets, like, when's this hymn going to be over? I oh, just you know, I want to get the coffee. Like, like that doesn't glorify God you know you know what I'm saying like don't look too like blank at me <laughs> we glorify him by enjoying him and demonstrating our joy in God this is what it's about a total re-evaluation of our life and a change so that we might become beacons to his glory and so Paul ends with these last three chapters that I'm going to look at just three verses by talking about his own friends and his own family. The people that he cares for most. Because he came from the Jewish nation and men and women who were not putting the trust in the same Jesus that he was. And this was his response. Sometimes theologians look at chapters 9, 10 and 11 of Romans as this kind of systematic theology of God's sovereignty and power. First and foremost, it's Paul dealing with the fact that there are his friends and families who are not putting their trust in Jesus. And he is theologically wrestling with this. He says, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. He is saying, I live with daily pain in my heart because my Jewish friends and family are not putting their trust in Jesus Christ. So you ask Paul on a Monday morning, hey Paul, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. I've got unending pain in my heart though for my family. <laughs> unending grief. Every day I wake up, this pain does not go away from my heart because there are friends and family members who are not putting their trust in Jesus Christ. Can I ask us how we feel about London right now? Can I ask us how we feel about our friends and our families who don't know Jesus? This isn't propaganda, this isn't agenda. If you're here and you're not a Christian, you think, well, what are you talking about? All I'm saying is that we found joy and we want other people to found everlasting joy. Paul says, I've got unending pain here. This vision of ours, has to be more than just words on a banner. If it's just words on a banner, it's a waste of a hundred quid. If they, like, this, this has to be something that touches our hearts so that we can testify that there is something deep down in my heart that grieves. I still think of school friends who I did school with who don't trust in Jesus and I pray for them. And there's a sense of like, God, 
would you just open their eyes like you opened mine when I was 18 I could see you for the first time so all it is your power being displayed want that one theologian says this about our hearts he says there is nothing more ugly than an orthodoxy without understanding or without compassion ouch oh no i know all the doctrine tell me ask me questions about the bible yeah but do you have compassion for your friends and your colleagues do you actually love the people around you that's the question and what does paul do with this pain in his heart he says in chapter 10 verse 1 brothers my heart's desire and prayer to god for them is that they may be saved let me ask you this question who are you praying for that they may be saved it's a very simple question i'm not asking for any hands in the air right now i'm just asking you think about who are you praying for that they may be saved at the moment and it's hard to get estimates on this at the moment there's they, there's around 700,000 people who are going to church who would call themselves christians in london which at some level is a lot of people 700,000 it's hard to get exact statistics but it's around that kind of figure that's a lot of people that's a, more than a lot of cities in the UK and yet that also means there are around 8 million people who in this city within a few miles radius of this place don't know Jesus don't know his glory can we start to pray for those people that they would come to know Jesus Christ even if we all pray for three people and just do our bit, our friends, our colleagues. I was just dreaming, bear with me for a moment this morning, just praying and thinking, okay, there's 700,000 people. It would be amazing if in our lifetime, we saw that figure touch over the million mark. You think at one level, like, oh, it's not much of a change. Like, what about, that's 300,000 people getting baptized into the name of Jesus Christ in a lifetime. That is a lot of salvation being poured out. What if we could just begin to pray, Lord, in our generation, would you tip the mark over a hundred Christian churchgoers on a Sunday? That there would be many more people who would find eternal life in Jesus Christ. That would be an amazing thing. That would be a spreading out of the glory of the Lord. If London is going to be filled with the glory of the Lord, it's going to be filled with an increasing number of Christ followers who are baptized and say, I give all the glory to God. This life is not about me. Amen. And this is what he says finally in chapter 11. He says in verse 11, So I ask, did they stumble? This is his friends and his family who is praying for in order that they might fall says by no means rather through their trespass their sin salvation has come to the gentiles that's people who aren't Jews mostly you and I so as to make Israel jealous and now if their trespass means riches for the world so if the Jews said no 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 I'm going to pass up on the Messiah and now others have come in and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles how much more will their full inclusion mean that is the Jewish nation there is going to be a moment where Jews come back to Jesus and we say yes we have seen that he is the Messiah and there will this be this glorious church reunited with Jews and Gentiles displaying the wisdom and the glory of God because one day the whole of the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of lord which will mean believers everywhere african and european and south american and american everyone coming together gathering and saying all glory to god and he closes this whole section in romans with these words in verse 33 oh the depths of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of god how unsearchable are his judgments and how unscrutable are his ways for who has known the mind of the lord or who has been his counselor who has given him a gift that he might be repaid for from him and through him and to him are all things and to him be glory forever and ever amen more people baptized into jesus 
it's glory to God. More disciples being made, it's glory to God. More people attributing God as the center of their life, it's glory to God. More people flooding to churches, it's more glory to God. More people lifting up worship in Jesus' name, it's more glory to God. More people singing his praises on tubes, it's more glory to God. More people opening up their Bibles on the central line going to work, it's more glory to God. More people talking about Jesus in Starbucks on a Wednesday afternoon, it's more glory to God. There is glory to be God to be had in people coming to Christ. And that is what we want to give our life to. Amen. 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 Can we have the band back up? And we're just going to respond. And um, I've said a lot of words. So I want to just ask you just to kind of quieten your heart and your mind for a moment. We're going to respond by taking communion together. Because this is the moment around which we, we gather. And it's a reminder of the reality and the righteousness of God that has saved us as followers of Jesus Christ. And just in this moment of prayer, I just want to encourage you because, you know, I was praying and I, I stuck a post-it note on my study wall and I said, 300,000 people baptised in my generation, question mark. What about it, Lord? Would you do that in this city? And honestly, I feel weak. I don't know how you feel. I feel like every year that goes past in my life, I feel less and less able, oddly. I feel more and more that I need the power of God in my life. I need God to come and touch my heart. I'm losing trust in my own abilities, to be honest. And this is the promise as we gather to Jesus, as we come to Jesus. This is the promise that, that was given to Paul and is given to us. Paul says, but Jesus said to me, and he says to us as a church, my grace is sufficient for you and my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults and hardships and persecutions and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And as we gather around this table and we drink this wine and we eat of this bread, what we are doing is we are putting our trust again in the power of God. And the word is not this, that you come to this table as weak people and you leave strong in yourself, is that actually you probably stay weak in yourself, but you have a supernatural spiritual power at work in you. In the moments when you're weak, then you're strong. So this is what we're gonna do. We're going to stand in just a moment and we're going to worship this Lord who in weakness died so that we can have power in our life. Jesus says, take this, this bread. He says, this is my body. This is his presence. He makes himself known through physical stuff. There's nothing magic about this bread. It happens to be gluten-free, by the way, in case you're interested. But Jesus says, when you gather around this in prayer and with my word through faith, you appropriate power into your life. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks with his friends, he gave it to them and said, this is my blood. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Father, I want to say thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, for dying on this cross for us so that we might have power to live a life that blesses this city that we love, Lord. 
And we pray that as we gather around this moment, you would fill us with your Holy Spirit again, and that the testimony that you have given us, Lord God, might overflow to those tomorrow morning. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. And let me just say one last thing as we worship. If you're not a Christian here this morning, you're so welcome. We're very glad that you're here. We hope that you feel at home. We hope that you feel comfortable here. This table is for those who, who know that Jesus Christ is their King. They say, I trust this Jesus. And if you don't trust Jesus today, or you're not sure, just know this, that you can come for the first time knowing that there are still questions to be answered in your mind and say, actually, I want to put my faith in Jesus. I want to receive this life and this power into my soul. You can come for the first time today and know him. You might ask, what do I have to do? Nothing. Just come by faith and he will flood your life with power. Amen.